like most sex soldiers. The only running we did was when when grizzly old sergeants made you run. A good year and a half uh, suicidal every day. One of my subscribers very kindly said, Chris, you need to speak to this guy. Within a month, getting to September, I've already lost the stone. Rich, how are you, brother? I'm okay, how are you? <laughs> yes, mate, I'm absolutely delighted to be talking to a fellow ultra runner. Although, <laughs> you usually when I have this sort of conversation, I'm always talking to someone who's um, way more competent at the sport <laughs> than I am. And I'm, I'm sure that this is the case today. I'm a, I like to dabble in things. I like to take part, Rich. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm, 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 I, I think the taking part is the most important element is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what I've learned over the last year is uh, they're hard enough just to complete one. <laughs> it's all about getting to the end and not really so much on, on where you finish, even though that's good. But <laughs> Yes, it's, it's basically getting to the end and still being alive, isn't it? That's the main yeah, yeah that was, that's the main goal. <laughs> So for our friends at home, I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, Rich and, and, and I'm going to find out probably as much as you guys are as we go along, because one of my subscribers very kindly said, Chris, you need to speak to this guy. Having seen an article which I'm looking at now, in, in, um, which was in the news. And first off, can I apologize to the person who put me in touch with Rich because I'm so overrun, I just can't keep up with everyone's names at the moment. But if you send me a line, brother, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a shout out um, who that kind gentleman was, or gentlewoman, I think it was a, a chat. But Rich basically lost eight stone within a year to run a hundred, uh, and, and also ran a hundred mile ultra marathon. Have I got that right, Rich? Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, so uh, it all started back in uh, 2020 uh, in the, the great lockdown. So that's, that's when my journey uh, started, uh, really, on, on, this, on this journey to, to become an ultra runner. Uh, up until then, I... I probably like like most sex soldiers. The only running we did was when when grizzly old sergeants made you run, um, <laughs> and, yeah. and so it it wasn't. Uh, even though I tried to do do it before, uh, it didn't really take. It was only once, uh, obviously, like I said in the in the lockdown, that that things started to take some momentum. So it was all the way. Back there. What? Who did you serve with, mate? Uh, I was with the uh, one Stafford, so I'm just the county regiment. Obviously, before they got all amalgamated. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I did just just over nine years with them, and I did. Uh, I came out, and then I went back as a reservist to do a tour in Bosnia. Uh, just at the end, yeah. So over and all, I did about nine years. Mm. Did you Did you go to Ireland, Northern? Yeah, Ireland? I did. Uh, did three tours of Northern Ireland uh, back in the day, and we was uh, as the peace pr Good Friday Agreement was signed. Uh, we was in West Belfast, so it stopped after the Armagh bomb. We was there for the Armagh bomb, uh, and then after that, when it all started to go through. Uh, we was there. So we went from uh, patrolling the streets uh, in West Belfast to uh, ending up at the Mays Prison, 
not doing anything <laughs> within a couple of weeks. It was I was really going to say, good Friday <laughs> agreement. Let's all go down a pub. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't life be great if it was that simple? <laughs> yeah, it would be. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was 92, wasn't it? Good Friday agreement. Uh, or am I, am I miles out? I, I was in Belfast in 89. I think it was about 90... Was it 95, 96? Uh, miles out. So I'm me... sure it was 96 when we, when we did our last tour of West Belfast. I think it was 96. Oh, yeah. It's saying it was signed, actually signed 10th of April, 1998. Uh. Okay. that It would have been there. Then it would have been in there. It would have been 98, yeah, because uh, I got out. Uh, not long after then, mm-hmm. before I I went and be a reservist in Bosnia. Got you. <laughs> well, um, one thing I talk a lot about, Rich, on this podcast, because I'm always trying to help people make sense of trauma um, and, and use it as an experience to go on like you have and do extraordinary things and, and, and hopefully see it as part of the journey, even though it's unpleasant at the time. Yeah. And with myself, a lot of people probably think, oh, I was traumatised in the Marines. And I'm like, no, I was traumatised as a child. <laughs> it's, it, I joined the Marines because I was a traumatised, damaged person. Damaged, that's probably the r- wrong word to use. But, you know, I, I, I probably joined the military for all the wrong reasons, <laughs> like, <laughs> like many of people. So I'm, I'm just wondering, before we talk about your active service, did, did you have a, you know, a stable upbringing or what was it led you to, to join the, to join the mob? Uh, well, I was schooled in the eighties. So I don't think anybody who was skilled, uh, who lived on a, on a rough council estate in the eighties were, was schooled very well, <laughs> was schooled very well. So, uh, it was a quite a turbulent sort of childhood. Um, I think my parents, like most parents in those days, they were too busy putting food on the table to, you know, uh, and w- were quite disciplined. And so, yeah, I think I had a normal childhood on, on a working class council estate, got myself into trouble, got in with the older kids, you know, uh, all the stuff that you would, you, that you could picture. I got into trouble with, but I'd always, always wanted to, to join the army. That's one thing I always wanted uh, to do. Um, and talking of, of, of childhood, I think I said that in, in the news article that I did, that, that when I've been through it and noticed things that happened in my childhood, uh, seeing, uh, I remember... Uh, a lad who was in my year, who I was friends with, I was there when his, his younger brother died in the quarry that we used to go and swim at. So just I remember that day quite vividly uh, and that sort of not being able to help why this younger boy who's been there with his brother uh, drowned, you know. So that, so that was one, you know, I, I forgot all about it and then, and then the last couple of years, I can remember it happening and thinking, yeah, and how it affected like the whole, the whole of the school, really. And us that were there and obviously the, uh, the lad who lost his brother. But, it, it, but things like that, that you, that you just put to the back of your mind that you, you don't realise that you... And back in those days, there was no counselling for kids who just saw somebody die who's just drowned, it, it's just one of those things that happen and you're sent back into school and you get on with it and, and that's what it was in those days. It's like it's like fast forward all those years later uh, that you realise that yet yeah, that you've not dealt with these sort of, uh, of things that's happened in your life. Mm. Yeah, and, the, and I think, would I say that my parents were abusive? Uh, for the day now, you, you know, they, 
It was so, rougher times back then, it, generally, it was, Rich. It was it? rougher times. I, I should imagine that you know, if 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 somebody, if my parents did to me what they did back then, now then then they'd probably you know be in prison. But back in those days, it, it was you know uh, it was totally different. So so now, but it, it just just the just the usual working class lad. Mm. He just had designs on, on on joining the army from a young age. I can remember watching a bridge too far, and my mom saying that your that my great granddad and two of his brothers uh, served the, uh, and were there at the Battle of Arnhem and and stuff like that. Just sends a, a young boy's uh, mind into overtime having seen that, and then my. One of my uncles served in the, the Gulf War. So obviously they, I was just all geared up, ready for going into the army. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I know what you mean. I saw a film about uh, astronauts going into space and I, I knew that was the life for me, Rich, you know. <laughs> then when I realised I was crap at everything, I joined the Marines. <laughs> Um, what, what was your fitness like then? Because one thing I'll say to a lot of people, um, is, and I've done a few, you know, I've done a few stunts over the years. So I, I've run, I've run the length of the country. Um, I knocked off a quadruple Ironman with, with eight weeks training, have, having come last in my first ever triathlon. Right. And what I say to people, it, the reason I can do such things is I understand my mind now so much better than when I was an 18-year-old in training in the military. And back then, oh, my God, I used to suffer on the speed marches. They were, it was like being in hell. I used to pray as I was running along for them just to, just to be over, just to see around the corner and there's the truck and it's like, yes. Oh, well, there's the camp just around the corner and it's it's over. Nice hot shower, you know, warm bed. Uh, and so and and so, yeah, so I, 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 I like to point out to people, I'm not natural at this sort of thing, but even not very natural runners can do extraordinary things um, with their bodies. Well, I've I was all, I've always been small. I'm five foot four, uh, so I was always small. So I was prone to bullying. Uh, the only thing is, I used to fight back and get into a lot a lot of fights. And uh, luckily for us, where we lived, uh, an amateur boxing club moved in and took the top floors of the working men's club exactly across the road. And my dad was sick of me going to school because uh, I've been in trouble I've been fighting and it's be only because I was small and, and quite aggressive and used to get picked on a lot but wouldn't stand for it uh, and so my dad said right you're going in there uh, see if that will calm you down uh, basically all it did was make, make me better at fighting to be fair but he did he did give me a, a sort of a, a jump start really to the discipline the training is quite hard to be a boxer uh, and I know we're naturally fit uh, as a child. I started at 12. But, he, but yeah, I was, I was quite fit, but my running wasn't there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm quicker now. I could probably do a, a BFT now quicker uh, than what I could when I was 16, 17. So it's just some 40, 46 now, and I could probably run back. I, I know I can run faster now than I could. When I was a teenager, which is... mate, I'm the same. <laughs> I'm the I'm the same, and I've got incredibly fit. Sorry, I'm moving my microphone around because it's. Tell me if I, my volume, if my audio goes rubbish. I'm moving it around because it's it's putting a shadow on my beautiful face, <laughs> and I don't want to deny the wonderful global public the chance to gaze at this and 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 dream basically. <laughs> Um, sorry, no, what, before I was talking shit, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm the same. I've, I've got incredibly fit, mate, of just jogging around the block, you know? Yeah. 
I, I'm quite a busy person, so I don't have time to do like a 16 miler on a Wednesday and a 20 miler on a Friday and a, even a four miler. Um, I got so quick at running around the block that I had to up it. So I now do a three miler every day, but I run up my city's steepest hill and it's a real like, but back when, when we're talking about back when I was a, like in my early twenties, I'd stop halfway up this hill and I'd have to walk a bit, you know, I'd look at the lampposts and it would kill me so much. I just pray, pray that I'm going to pass that lamppost. And when I get to it, then I pray that I'm going to pass that lamppost. Now I run up it like a breeze and I've got so cheeky at it that very rare, occasionally a mountain bike, uh, uh, someone out for a morning cycle or another runner tries to take the champ. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bad move. Right. I know we shouldn't live in our ego, but yeah, I what? think we do. It's a, uh, it's a, uh... Yeah, Especially my, for men, I think it's. Uh, I think we're always living in our ego, when, even when we don't even realise we are. Yeah, we, we, we always try if somebody passes us on a run or whatever. We just we just want to to catch them up. I think it's just mm-hmm. the man thing. <laughs> I'll say, don't poke the bear. <laughs> they poke the bear. They're going to get taken down. I'm sorry. And and the trouble is, when you overtake me on that hill, you have then got to keep that pace up for the whole hill and it 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 is tasty this hill <laughs> so once you overtake me you've got to keep that speed because then when i come alongside you at the time where you're thinking actually i wish i could slow down now <laughs> but the point wasn't to big myself up it was just to say it's incredible at 52 i'm way fitter than i've ever been in my life and i love it and it's it's meant it it's just so in- Running for me is nothing to do with exercise. It's just a spiritual experience. It's just a beautiful way to start my day. And I, I, I'm just indebted to it. And I, I'm sharing this with everybody because paradise is just literally is a switch in your head and bang, put your running shoes on. And it, 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 it's definitely a big step on the way, mate. Don't you think? Yeah, I, I think I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about middle-aged men who who, who put themselves out there. I mean, like with Rich Roll and, and, and people who, who come to these things. And Damien Hall, ultra, British ultra runner, is the same. Started in his late 30s into his 40s and, and he's super quick and super fit and, and never run before. I don't. I don't know what it is. I think. I don't. I think it. It must be uh, a kickstarting in our bodies, uh, and our bodies changing to meet the demands that we're put, putting on. Uh, maybe that didn't happen as as teenagers. Uh, maybe our bodies are stronger as we get older, and, and work them, and 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 they must perform well. Obviously, they do because uh, it's there. In the science, I think when people measure these people and and like ourselves, we can measure ourselves and think, yeah, I've no way I could have run this quick. Uh, maybe that I didn't want to back back then. That may have been the the <laughs> the, the crux of it. There, maybe we didn't want to. I I always I always look back and think, what would have happened if I'd have did this or or I'd have that have done that in my military career. It wasn't long. Uh, I was only ever a, a private. I, always, I was always in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was a, a good soldier. I had good and bad points. My, I was more of a, I was better in the field. Uh, do, I suppose you can say real soldiery. Uh, but as my one sergeant major said to me when he was going to put me on an NCO's carder, uh, that a good soldier is a good all round soldier, not somebody who's good in the field. And I always think back and think to myself, well, well, you might get a, a great soldier, but if he's no good when the chips are down, then what what is he good for? Because <laughs> that, that's when it counts, is when you are in the field. And so... Yeah, but 
I can remember going to the careers office and uh, like I said, I was five foot four. I was like probably just, I was just touching about seven stones. So I was really skinny, weedy, small. And uh, walking into the, the careers office in Cannock and saying I want to join the parachute regiment and this sergeant saying that there's no way you you would you would have passed P Company because of your size. And so straight away, I, he, he even said to me, he said, I, I said, well, okay, then I'll join the infantry. And he was like, I don't think you'll pass basic training for the infantry because of how small you are. And uh, This guy's really sizest, isn't he? He, he is, yeah, you know. Uh, uh, but I can remember... I can remember going back after after finishing basic training and, and, and coming on leave once I'd reached battalion and, and going back into the careers office and uh, that sergeant smiling and, uh, and saying to me, I knew you'd do it because you had that sort of determination anyway. Uh, but I'd, all I wanted to ever be was an in, in, was an infantry soldier and, and so that's that's what I wanted to do and I can remember going back and just walking through into the careers office and that sergeant sitting there and just smiling and saying did you do and I was like yeah and he says well I knew you would I just saw it as I'd give you an helping hand <laughs> uh, but yeah it was hard I must admit the training was hard I mean the tabbing was was hard with with weight for me being so small, and I always, when we were speed marching, having to take two extra steps. So when others were walking, I was technically running. <laughs> just, I was the just same. Just to keep pace. <laughs> I used to voluntarily go at the back of the troop, which generally is where the tall guys go because they have the short guys at the front. Yeah, yeah. But I can. I. I, I mean, I'm five seven and a half um and i was like you every 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 few steps i'd have to take another step to to, to catch up or put two quick steps in to keep in st and in the end i was just making people go out step so it'd be through at the back and i by, didn't even need to say it i was halfway at the back anyway <laughs> then um i'll tell you just before i forget one other thing about getting older is you throw up, throw off the preconceptions about running. And by what, by that, i got Dean Karnazes coming on the show. I think next week he's probably one of the world's most famous ultra runners. They call him ultra marathon man. I know you would have heard of him, Rich. And when I read Dean's book, I, I was gobsmacked because I'd done a marathon by then. The marathon nearly killed me i mean just like the speed marching it was ninja to run a marathon and i ran all the way i literally ran every step of the way under four hours which was one of the hardest things i've ever done i i was of that old school kind of probably tv brainwashed mentality that i thought if you ran one step further than a marathon you drop down dead like the marathon is the epitome <laughs> of human endurance right then i meet dean or dean's book the guy runs 300 miles in one go oh yeah and i thought do you know what i'll have some of that if he can do it i can do it and and off the back of that i realized how massively we're lied to by society we're led to believe that we're these crap people that can't even r really run for a bus and it's just not true, Rich, is it? I've, I don't think it's true. And what I've noticed at my running group, and you've got, you've got like, you've got two distinct camps. You've got those who do the traditional sort of running and, and, and won't do any more than a, than a marathon. And then you've got these, like myself, probably come to the sport later and just bought stuff. This I'm not interested on that. I'm I'm going to go and do 
the longest and hardest races that I can find. Mm. <laughs> and what I've noticed is most of them have got beards and tattoos and 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 have had crisis in their lives and 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 runnings like what they've used to to bring themselves back. Uh, and so I don't, yeah. I don't usually notice that, mate, because they're always like a long way behind me, you know. <laughs> not, it, not. <laughs> it's it's and, it, and and so I'm probably not your traditional. I don't even see myself as as a runner really. I'm I'm just like uh, even though I train really hard, it's like a wing it. It seems like a wing it because I just think oh, okay, I'll go and have a do with this, or I'll do this, or I'll, I'll just read a book. And then, and then apply it to myself, and 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 so, I wouldn't say I'm a traditional runner in the sense. I suppose, I, sp- I suppose I'm probably a more of an endurance athlete, uh, just because of the fact that I don't really, I wouldn't put myself into to the the traditional running shoes. Uh, doing a ten k or a five k just just does not flap my boat at all. Uh, what I'm, what I'm, I usually find is when I run fast, I, un, I normally get injured. So I don't. I'd, I'll probably run fast uh, in the summer. Probably do like we we. It's called the chase, where the slowest go first, and the and the the quickest go at the back, and it's you try and uh, beat as many people as you can, or, or try and beat the next group in front of you so I'll do that in the summer but that's the only sort of speed work and mm. and, and running fast that I do because I've, this last 15 months was real, where I've realised this that the faster I run the more injuries I pick up so I just keep to a to an ultra shuffle to be fair <laughs> got ya we'll co- we'll, I, I look forward to coming on to that I just quickly <laughs> want to cover um, you your time in Bosnia and Northern Ireland, did, did you see what they call action or did you suffer casualties? Because uh, Bosnia was, <laughs> a, I mean, Ireland was nasty, uh, certainly in places, but Bosnia was a not uh, not pretty at all, was it? No, it, it wasn't. Would I say it's in action? Uh Mm, probably I was there when it was kicking off. So, but personally, uh, I was there when they, when they bombed Cross McGlynn, probably for the, the thousandth time. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was there. Did they, they manage to hit the camp? Because, the- yeah, yeah, they, there was always rebuilding it. Uh, was anyone spent, was anyone hurt? Yeah, there there were a few people hurt when I was there when they when they did it. We just got off. Uh, we were we was based at Ballykinla, and so we was we was the Rulemont Battalion. So we did two years. Uh, obviously, a month on, month off, round say far more. Uh, and obviously, Cross McGlenn was there, Newbury uh, was there. I didn't, I was never shot at or thinking that I just, uh, I just saw the trauma, the aftermath on things which do stay with you. Mm. Uh, Can you give so, us an idea, Rich? You don't have to, don't uh, upset yourself or anything, but just. People at home won't ever have heard this sort of stuff, or some of them won't heard uh, sort of heard this stuff. Um, like when we got mortared in Belfast, they missed the camp. They knocked they knocked a six year old kitty off his bike. You know, so they mortared a six year old. Well, we was I think the probably the worst that I'd seen uh, that probably has been a, a lot was was the Armor bomb that that just ripped a, through that. That town that day, I'll never forget that day as long as I live. Uh, it it wasn't a pretty sight at all, and and for I think when you're a soldier, you know you're going in arms way, 
and 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 to see you see your friends hurt, which a few of them was uh, doing different things, even even in training. You know, I can I know of a few a few of my friends who died in training. All road traffic accidents seem quite popular. Uh, it comes with the the job, doesn't it? Really, uh, but but when there's in, innocent civilians, uh, like one of my friends, uh, I'm not going to mention him. Uh, like one of my friends, he can still remember protecting. They moved all the bodies to, I think, to Belfast Airport. I remember him saying. Uh, and all he was uh, guarding the place, and all he could remember was just the smell of burnt bodies. And so it, it's just stuff like that. Like I can remember him telling me that that he can just not get that smell out of his head. It, just that smell, just you know, the burning, you know, burning of the barbecue. He just smells that, and and for me it was was just seeing that devastation that day. Uh, we wasn't the first on there, uh, but by the time we'd rocked up, it was it was just horrendous. <laughs> and, and, and so these these things that you yeah, I didn't see action. I was in between the two gulfs, Gulf Wars. Uh, so you can say I didn't see no action, but I, I saw uh, I saw I saw enough uh, to keep me awake at plenty of nights, uh, and for that to, to process, and 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 we didn't. I don't think there was any any of those soldiers, especially from from my regiment, whoever had counselling or whoever yeah. had, had had anything to to help with their issues. It just wasn't done then. It wasn't that we didn't even talk about it. You know, we just left, got on, and and got on with the next thing. Where we were sent to, same when we was in in uh, Safe Armour. Uh, I think there was an IUC officer who who, who got shot at Newry, uh, and we was on the scene pretty quick. And we never talked about that ever. Yeah, we never. Yeah. Even even when we got back after we we we'd done a month there, no, we talked about it when we got back to. To Balikin, they're in the barracks. There was nobody there. They didn't send us to the Padre or a councillor come round. You, you just, you just got on with it. And obviously, I, I, I hope that things have changed now within the, you know, within the system. I hope so. I hope so. It's not like that. That that people are coming in their forties and fifties and who are having problems, which they are. But I hope it has changed. I don't know. Mm. I'm not. I'm not so much of a, a regimental person. Uh, I think some people are, really love doing the, the veteran thing and, and going to uh, and and doing the regimental associations and things like that. that that's not me, really. Uh, I wasn't that, ever that kind of soldier any, anyway. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, mm. he, he, I think that's... Part of the process, what sent me down this road was, was that trauma from childhood for what I saw in the army. Uh, it all played on my mind, really. I tried to forget about it. And that's basically what I did, really, was just put it to the back of my mind and, and forget and move on with my life. Uh, and not really kept in touch with with fellow veterans either. Really, I was on like some regimental pages and a few I kept in, but never met them in person and went drinking or anything like that. I just it was just like yeah, that's the end of my life. I'm cutting off on. Got married, had a family, and so it it, it was like to the back of my mind. Um, but obviously it comes back, doesn't it? <laughs> Which you know now. Uh, and different sort of sort of triggers set me off. Um, so about three years ago, I lost my job. 
uh, and then I had this sort of but before that I had started getting tinnitus and it and I don't know if if mental health brings it on but it just suddenly just went really bad and I was getting like two hours sleep a night and it was horrendous and so I got the tinnitus I was processing all this stuff that I'd saw all this stuff from my childhood uh you know, like my mom and dad splitting up when I was, I think it was about 10, all this stuff, my mom leaving and being raised by my dad and all this sort, this sort of stuff that you, that you just get on with back in, back in the day. It's like all comes up and it, it, it and it's imagine if you talk about it over a, a time, you can process it, but if you don't, it just all comes back at once. And, uh, and it did. So it was just like a perfect storm for me. Got this tinnitus, processing all this mental health. I must have spent a good year and a half uh, suicidal every day, every day. I've not worked in three years, not worked at all. I couldn't, I, there's no way that I'd have let myself to, to go back to either what I was doing or you know, how, how can you work on two hours sleep, suicidal, with all this stuff in your mind? You, you just got, there's just no way you can, you can do it. Uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't much of a husband. I wasn't much of a, I mean, I'm not the best husband and, I, <laughs> and I'm no way I'm the best father and, and will never deem to be that, that, that I am. But I'm, I know that my wife saw the change in me uh, and the kids. Uh, and basically all, all I was was just this this fat middle-aged man on the settee watching telly or trying to get sleep and, and, and not engaging. And, and um, obviously food became a, a bit of a, a vice. I've, I've always had a problem with food, uh, always. Even before I left the army, some of the pictures of me on my last tour of Ireland and in Bosnia, I was getting bigger. I just let myself. I thought, yeah, I'm leaving. I've got my papers in. I was doing, I've seen my year out and I was just getting bigger, bigger, <laughs> bigger and bigger even then. Uh, and so I've always had a problem with food, always. I can remember as a kid. Uh, it was only doing things like boxing and joining the army that I think kept me thin all, all throughout. Uh, yeah, comfort eating. It was. I'm gonna I'm gonna come on to that because I'm I'm fascinated because I can eat I can eat for ten people. I'm, I'm, when I when I go for a meal, I always eat more than anyone else at the table, and it never used to be a problem. But in recent times. I've started to realise when I'm comfort eating and I think it's really important to, to, to know your vices and then take action yeah. against them. So I'm really interested to come on to that. Did, was there uh, any alcohol or substances? Uh, so part of my journey in life, uh, <laughs> I, met, I met my first wife uh, through people who knew her back uh, and but what I did realise is part of her family were Mormons and the way that I uh, I ended up joining a cult as well <laughs> so it was like <laughs> so it was like I've gone from and I've, I just imagine it's part of trying to deal with what I saw and and, and so I joined I become super religious as well so they they don't drink but the but you can eat, uh, and so, like I said, like three years ago, I've been a Mormon as well, uh, so I've been super religious, uh, and I notice a few of my friends uh, who had, I think one of them had been shot, 
uh, while he was in Iraq and became super religious after. Uh, it seems to be like a, a theme for some people. Uh, and so that, and then three years ago, found out, watched, researched all this stuff on the internet, found out it was a load of, a load of you know, crap and come out. And my wife, who, my second wife, who had been born into it, came with me. So we was dealing with that as well. So I'd lost my job, got this tinnitus, not dealt with issues from my past, mental health, suicide, processing all this stuff we'd done as a family, being in a in a in a in a like a super call them cult or call them a cult they may not be classed as a cult I don't know don't, but that, you don't have to mate don't apologize I've, I've, uh, I've pro- if I was completely honest I've probably been involved it probably been in four cults now <laughs> and I include the military as as one of them as much yeah as, yeah yeah probably know, yeah you yeah, know that a high you, demand you, sort you of you can tell it you can tell a cult is when you leave people try and talk you out of it yeah, when, you, yeah, when, yeah. when you leave a normal job no one gives a shit they buy you a gold watch or you know take you for a few beers down the pub um well then well because i was such so much of a troublemaker i was never on opera long trying to get me back in i think there's probably glad to see me go <laughs> they're probably glad to uh, to see me go but yeah so I've come out of that as well. And we've come out, it's all happened all this same sort of time. Uh, and so all this stuff I was having to deal with. And being a man, being a middle-aged man, being in the army, growing up in the 80s, all I thought was to do was to try and tackle it on my own. So it just... Just made it worse. <laughs> it just made it worse. Uh, and so, yeah, so I was like, it's like suicidal. Uh, all this stuff every day, every day. Uh, just wanted to to just get away from from everything. And the only things that were keeping me was my was my wife and children. To be honest, uh, and so that was happening all the way through and then before that but while this was happening i started uh, getting help uh, using talking therapies and this did help it did and then i decided like an idiot to cut it short because i thought i'm okay now and and from uh medical advice i cut it off too early i thought oh, i'm okay now it's all done. I've, I've sorted it out. I've talked to all this stuff out. Uh, and I was saying, we want you to carry on our foot now. And being the egocentric pig headed that man that I am, uh, just cut it all short. Uh, and then six months later was, was not back in the same place, but I was still depressed, overweight, not moving on in, with my life. Uh, and then COVID hits. Uh, what do I end up doing? I end up drinking, eating more. Because uh, part of my progress is I wanted to go back to work. Obviously, that stuffed all that up because I was up against it anyway, <laughs> having this time off uh, through mental health. And then loads of people are out of jobs or on, you know, it, Mm. or they were whatever it was called the back then but there's nothing I could really do so I was just sat at home uh, self-medicating with food and booze uh, and then that's when I went on I was always around about the 14 15 star mark uh, but when you're 5 foot 4 you look really fat even that you know if you're 6 foot 2 and you're 15 stone you, you, you're like an average person, but when, but when you're like, when you're five foot four and you're like 15 stone, I was fat. I was obese. And, and then over those six months or two a year, I got even heavier. So I ended up just shy of 18 stone. Uh, and that was in August. 
of 2020. And so we go on holiday, me and my wife, and I have a really bad term when I'm down there. And I can remember really, really being horrible uh, to my wife and my kids. And my wife gave me an ultimate and says, I've had enough of your crap. I've helped you through all this ultimatum. You either change now or you go, because I can't handle this no more. Uh, and that was uh, a kick, a big kick up in the, the backside. And so I can remember coming home and thinking to myself, what I have I not done to help myself? And I thought my weight is, when I really looked at it, it was my weight that was keeping me back. And so I thought, okay, then I need, I need to change, make some lifestyle changes. Uh, I promised my wife, because of my drinking, that I wouldn't drink again. Uh, I realised that it's not a good mix for me. Uh, and like most soldiers, uh, I can't just have one or two pints. A quiet, you know, a quiet night, you know, one or two pints and come back home. I have to get legless. But, and even at home, my wife is like, you just can't have a couple of points. You, you, you've just got to get drunk. And I'm like, yeah, I've just got no sort of, I'm not an in between you person anyway. I'm either, I'm either not doing anything or I'm just putting my heart and soul into everything. I've not got none of this sort of middle road. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm not that kind of person. And so, that August, I when we got, got back off the holiday, I thought, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change, uh, and so I, I put myself on a, on a diet, of likes and flop. Well, what I did, I did a bit of research, and uh, and then I looked at what would be like a, a change, what would be best to me. And, I'd, I'd read about this like high fat, low carb sort of diet and like these primal or paleo diets and whatnot. And I thought, I can eat meat, I can eat cheese, you know. Uh, and so I'll, I'll be quite happy on that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not good on the greens or whatever, but that's like a necessary evil. Uh, but you know, I could eat meat. So that was a, a big one, uh, for me. So I, I hit the paleo. Oh, diets within within uh, within a month, getting to September, I've already lost the stone, and all I did was just cut down how much I ate and changed what I, what I ate. So I was I was now hardly any carbs. The carbs I did have were from were from salads and vegetables. All right, let's. I just want to cut in there because I think a lot of people listening, like myself, will have a carb addiction. And to explain it for people listening who might not be aware, it, it's that feeling when you have a meal without carbs and carbs are not carbs in the way we eat them in the Western world. I say Western world in, in the modern world is what I mean. Is it overabundance? It's all the stuff you wouldn't eat naturally. You, you don't go out as a hunter gatherer and pick 5,000 grains of rice in, in an hour for your family. It, it, you, you, it, it's just, Unnatu yeah. it's unnatural and yet because of modern farming methods and because of globalization we get all these th this massive abundance of carbs which is hunter gatherers we wouldn't have grown we you know for for the millions of years of our evolution we wouldn't have we wouldn't have fed on but but what they do is they quick quickly turn to sugar in the body or, or glucose and they give you a glucose high so you become quite, and then we mistake that high for being full up. And the point I'm getting to is that when you have a meal, like a paleo meal, you can very often at the end of it, you just, it's like your dessert stomach's kicking in and you're like, oh, just, I need, I need something more. And how, how did you get o over that, Rich? Or did, did, was that not a problem for you? Uh I'd say the first couple of weeks were, was hard. I got the brain fuzz. 
because obviously I've got no sugars go, going in. <laughs> so, so most of my life, I've probably been addicted to sugar. I'm still am now. That my diet now, I have to put some sugars in there because I just can't get enough uh, energy in my body sometimes. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so I had the brain fuzz. Yeah, it was hard. But I noticed after a couple of weeks that that what I was having was filling me up and I wasn't feeling hungry. And what I realised is, is uh, when we have a lot of carbs, it raises our insulin uh, and it, it all gets turned to fat. So it's the carbs that make people fat, uh, not the fat. <laughs> so I realised this. I realised that that sugar is really addictive, that carbs are really addictive, uh, and that you cut them out, you can lose a lot of weight in a short period of time and, and be healthy at the same time because I did it. Uh, and so by September, I'd, I'd lost the stone. And I was like, frick, this is amazing. My wife was like, hey, she was like, yeah, I can see you you're going to do this. So Rich, uh, can I just clarify, did you cut carbs out altogether? So no, like no rice, no, or did you just cut them down? No rice, no bread. The what only about- carbs I, I had were from, were from salads and gr- leafy green vegetables. Well, that was potato- the only- potatoes. I didn't have potatoes. Good. Uh, I do, I do have them now because they're chock full of energy. Uh, and I'd rather eat potatoes than 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 other stuff that that I can have. But I do, I still don't eat m- much of them. But I cut all that out and and cut my my portions down dramatically. But what I was realising is that I could go the other end. I could, I, I could before then I could probably I couldn't go an hour without having something to eat, and then I could go like. I could do intermittent fasting, like, and like, I could eat at five o'clock and then go all through the night and feel full until I'd slept the next morning and still not feel that I need to eat. It was like, it was like really, really like eye opening. And I think that was the biggest change that I saw was my relationship with food starting to change. Uh, within that, month i'd started to walk obviously i was too big uh to do anything like grandiose at that time i could you know i used to i used to get pretty out of breath just going up the stairs and just walking up a a slight incline of a hill would have me out of breath and i would have to stop if it was a big hill like there was one hill on holiday it was probably about 500 meters with with quite a steep incline, I'd stop halfway just for a breather. And my grandkids on another holiday were making fun of me because we'd gone to uh, Pembrokeshire and we'd gone over to this island and it was quite a, it's got some good hills. But for some reason, they had put benches like every 500 metres. So every time we stopped to take a picture, I'd have a sit down on the bench and all the grandkids would make fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> granddad and it, it, it that was like you know I look granddad sitting down again because <laughs> he's too fat to move and uh and so I was in a right state and so I just started walking September comes and this is this is what changed my life so I'm sitting in my shed where I am now and uh got me telly in here I was watching YouTube. Uh, I can't remember what I was doing. I, was, I think I was just watching YouTube. And uh, I didn't know what sort of fitness I was going to do. The gym was going to be heavily involved. I might have put a bit of running in there. Uh, but I remember sticking on YouTube. I've been watching some of David Goggins' uh, stuff. Uh, but I remember watching... It was called Unbreakable, and it was quite an old film, a uh, YouTube video by this time about the Western States 100 mm-hmm. Ultra Race. And I thought, what's this Unbreakable? Clicked on it. Now, I'd heard of Ultras before. I'd heard 
a few of more uh, a few of the lads from the Staffords had done some of them, but I'd not really taken any notice and just thought they were idiots, to be fair. So I think one of them, he did a 40-mile race, and then I think one of my other friends like did Marathon Disables, and I just thought, don't you think, if you not had enough of the sand, means that you've, you, you, you've gone to the Gulf twice, you know, you're going back to then run in the sand again, do 24 miles every day for six to seven days. I was just like, that's just crazy. Uh, but I remember watching that, that film, watching Killian Jornet and watching a few others running. It was like it was titled there. It was the most competitive Western States race that ever be would be that would be that year. And it is started. That, is that the documentary? One of the lads has got his shirt off the whole race. He, even yes. In, even in the snow at the beginning, he's got. Yeah, he the, got sh- that's the one. The beardy bloke. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I've got a beard, but I've not got a. I'm not six foot and tanned and 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 really good looking like he was. But yet he didn't. I think he's Anton did something, and he. I do. I, I forgot his name now, but yet he just ran without a shirt most most of, most of the way. Yeah, I tried. I tried doing that, but I I find that I, I get so many women throw themselves at me. <laughs> it just slows you down. My mine's mine's not. Not a, a good look now because I have got quite a bit of loose skin, so it's, it's not it's, all these skins bobbly. <laughs> so it's so it's not a good look. But it, yeah. it was. I watched that, and I watched Killian Jornet. That and there was four of them at the front, and they were racing. But they was having so much fun at the same time. They were running and jumping, and they were catching up. And I was just like. Just the freedom that they had, I was just like blown away by it. And then something happened. Uh, Killian Jornet fell over and he hurt himself. And he was wearing this white sort of all in one thing. And he was like, he fell over and he was just black. And I think a couple of them, I think that, that beardy guy, Anton, was in front. They stopped, turned around, ran back. And the three of them helped him up. And, they, and then they all ran into the aid station together to make sure that Killian was all right and didn't start back until Killian was back running again. And that just blew me away. I was just like, what sort of race that, that four of them at the front in most competitive race can stop and wait for one of them to get ready and get back on track again? It was, yes. I, my mind was just blown away by it. And then I remember halfway through, uh, they brought Scott Girac on. And he's the same age as me. Uh, and he was like 46. And this geezer had won it nine times. Yeah. <laughs> He'd won this race nine times. Not, and then not just that, first... but we should also point out a completely plant-based run, 100% vegan. Yeah, yeah so it's totally different to what... <laughs> I'm probably more of a, a meat based when I, <laughs> with a bit of vegetables and a bit of salads chucked in. Uh, but I was just looking at this guy. I was just looking at this guy. He was 40. He was 45 at the time. I was 45. I was just looking at him, looking at me and thinking, what have you done to yourself? What have I done to myself? I'm like 17 stone. Can hardly move. And then he got this guy in front of me, tanned, lean, just, you know, just looked 20 years younger than me. And I was just thinking, what have I done to myself? And then that's when it just came to me. I'm going to become an ultra runner. Uh, and then while I was sitting here, I thought, right, I'm going to do this in 12 months as well. Just have this crazy idea. I'll do it in 12 months. Knew nothing of running. <laughs> I've never been in any races. Oh, yeah, I had been in one race. Uh, a few of us, uh, when we were stationed at Market Drayton, uh, got cajoled to go and take it in turns and push 
this lady in a wheelchair. So I did about five or six miles in a marathon pushing a lady in a wheelchair. I think that's the closest I'd, I'd ever done to any sort of like race was like, was push this lady in a wheelchair doing the marathon. Who, and I only did five miles, so that was the end. But so I've not done any races or anything. I knew nothing about running. The only running I knew was what my boxing coaches made me do when I was a teenager and what I had to do in the army <laughs> to, to stay fit. Uh, but I never did any myself. I never did no fitness myself is what we did, <laughs> you know. And you, it was the look of the draw. If you got a sergeant, you know, a platoon sergeant who was a bit fat and a bit chubby, you didn't do much PT. But if you got one of the really fit ones, you know, then it was your worst nightmare and you'd end up, you know, doing 10 miles every day fitness. Uh, and so I watched that and I just said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to become an ultra runner. That's what I'm going to I'm gonna do. Uh, I'd already lost the stone. So I'd always put myself on that path to be able to, to think, yeah, I can change myself here. I remember going and telling my family, uh, my kids just laughed. They thought it was hilarious. And other people who were told just found it hilarious. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you become an ultra runner. I remember one person, one black, and he's a little bit autistic and he, he just, says what he thinks yeah. You know? yeah and he just said to me it's you become an ultra and he's like no why are you doing that and so i was just like but this is all fuel for my fire uh and let's re let's just remember you should expect people to say this because, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. You know, it's crazy isn't it? it's crazy it, it <laughs> does seem crazy and also it it's an achievement to do what you've done. It's a real, it takes guts, integrity, courage, belief, uh, uh, and, and let's say a love for your children, right? But you still want to be here for them in, in, in 10 years, 20 years, 30, yeah. 40 years time, right? And to other people, these are qualities that they can only aspire to. I think, I think what's, What's been giving me the most is the legacy of it. Uh, I'll just give you this quickly. So I did 30 marathons to 30 days straight uh, November. And uh, one of my grandchildren was at school uh, and she Googled my name and put Richard Wilcox Marathon Runner and all the stuff that I've done came up and she was at school and saying, look, this is my granddad. And I was just thinking to myself, there's no way to, you know, you know, two years ago, she could have never have done that. And none of my family could have ever have envisioned being able to do that. Brilliant. Mate. So it's, it's the legacy, but we can come on to that after that. That's one of the biggest things that, that, that I've seen now is the, the knock on effect. Not so much. We've, We've uh, it's more of the the younger generation coming up, uh, and so but yeah, so I was telling people this what I'm gonna do, and people just like the only person who who when I started to get into it and was losing more weight was my wife because she knew she's she's known me the longest, and she knows once I, I put my mind to something, there's I'm not gonna stop until I physically can't do it. Either, you know, I'm just going to put myself and, and do it. So she could see me changing and knew that, yeah, he's real, whereas other people weren't. Uh, wouldn't think that way because they didn't know I me mean, and just thought, yeah, and I was putting it on, on Facebook and people probably just thought it was a bit of a, of a joke. And I suppose he, he probably, yeah, uh, this fat bloke saying that he's going to become, do a, a hundred mile race or a hundred mile whatever and 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 so and people had not heard of ultra run anyway it's 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 fringe within a fringe sport anyway and oh, it's really Rich, let, let's talk about how did you embark on the training then because one <laughs> one thing i'll tell everyone when i did my first marathon 
I, I ran quarter of a mile around the block and I, I did that for a couple of weeks just to get into it. Then I moved it up to a mile. Then, well, you know the score, you, you do two mile and then you, then four mile becomes easy. So you do, and, 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 and not every day folks at home, just three times a week. That's all you need to run. If you do every day, you're going to get exhaustion. Um, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, right. So I started walking like I'd already started walking anyway. Uh, and then after I watched this video, I was like, well, I need to put something in place. Uh, so what I did was I walked more. So what I did was I just walked and walked and walked until I could walk for an hour. Uh, and then I thought, okay, I'll put a bit of running in. So every day I'd get out. And I'd walk for an hour, and at the start, I'd, I'd run for a couple of minutes. So that's what I started doing. It. it was walking with a bit of running. Uh, up until, I think it was the end of October, when I clocked my first official run on Strava, and I'd run for over an hour. And that was like a really big achievement for it. But at this time, all my walking and all my exercise was done at night because I was really body conscious. <laughs> and and I'd, I'd like witnessed other people and all the, you know, I live on a, I live on a, on a council estate in the Midlands. <laughs> There's a lot of kids. There's a lot of people who, you know, who are not scared. Hey, you, need, but... <laughs> you need to learn the expression. <laughs> Do you know the expression? No, no, what's the expression? It, there's us and there's wankers. <laughs> yeah. That's it. You don't give a fuck what 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 sad sad people think or, or yeah. children. <laughs> well, you know, the, you can imagine the teenagers on the estate, you know. <laughs> I was and they all know me as well. So I'm, oh, I know, I I, 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 I was get like it. I was fair game to them, so I'd go out as 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 light as I could uh, and and get it out, out the way. But it really took off. It really did take off. Like I said, by the end of October, I could run for an hour. By by Christmas time, I'd lost eight stone. Mm. Nearly, well, I'd lost seven stone. There's a, a Facebook thing that I put on that I'd, I was 11 stone. I'd gone from, in August, eight stone, 18 stone to December and being 11 stone. Incredible. That was just, it was just unbelievable. It just came off. My wife got worried. She was like, go to the doctors because you're starting to do all this running. Uh, you've lost all this weight. Go to the doctors and just see that you're not like messed yourself up losing this weight, Chrissy. But I just felt confident in my body that even though it had gone it was extreme. It was okay. I felt okay. Uh, I was eating really well. Probably, I've let myself go a bit now, to be fair. Uh, but then I was really eating really well. The best I'd ever eaten. And like, uh, I don't do as, as, I don't do it as much now. I, I think because of all the, the exercise and the running I do do, Fasting for 24 hours is, is quite a... I notice when I do do intermittent fasting, when I, when I run in the morning, I probably get PBs. It's really weird. If I've not eaten since like like uh, half past three in the afternoon and then go all the way through. Oh, massively. I, I, I fasted the, uh, last month for five days and I, I ran every day except one. For people at home, don't do this. You're not a professional. I, I do fitness for, for a living. Um, but um, the second day, so about 48, you know, by 48 hours, most of the food is out of your digestion yeah. system, right? Not, not all of it, but the stress that's off your body because you're not digesting food is enormous. And yeah. that stress 
means you've got a lot more energy, you know, a lot more strength. And, and when you run, you physically feel that your stomach's not bloated with food and that your body's not trying to do two jobs. It's, it's trying to digest here and it's trying to run here. It's, it's like you're doing double. And, and, you've, and you've got these professional coaches who are telling people to carb load before they do a marathon yeah. for all this, this like intense, you know, putting their body in probably more pressure than running a marathon by carb loading the night before. <laughs> my second, my second run, Rich, uh, I got my personal best up, the, like I say, up the steepest hill in my city, my personal best ever. So since when I was 18, and that's two days after not eating food. Not suggesting anyone at home does it. It's something no. I, I've, <laughs> I've, I've learned an awful lot about is fasting and exercise. Um, so, mate, you're firing. And which ultra did you put in for? Well, it was, it was a journey. So the first thing that I really did was, uh, I think about March, I, I was... I was uh, I was slowly uh, slowly getting sh- stronger and fitter, uh, but I knew nothing about running. To be fair, so I knew a lot about tabbing or yomping if you're a marine or whatever you, you want to call it. I, I I know a lot about that. So what I, I decided to do was in March was to prepare to run 100 miles. I'd walk 100 miles. So I, I walked uh, 100 miles in three days uh, with 35 pound in weight. Uh, and so I did that. that was, I, I walked the two Saints Way from uh, Chester Cathedral down to Litchfield uh, and then back. It was just, it was just under 100 miles. And so that was the first thing I did. I did that in March. So I did that. And that was a, that was a great experience. A wild camp <laughs> in some of the weirdest places. Because uh, I'm too stingy to pay for a, a hotel. Um, and so, yeah, and didn't know where I'd be. Uh, and so I, I did that three days and, and wild camp. And that, that was a really big boost as, as well. Uh, and then what I, init- what I was initially going to do after I did that, I was going to run the Two Saints way. And uh, and then I realised there were too many styles en route. And uh, I thought, no, I'm not the tallest. Keep going over these styles. It's just horrendous. Uh, and so I, I sacked running the two saints way on the head, which would have, I was going to run it from, from Chester Cathedral down to Litchfield and then back to Cannock where I live. And that would have been, that would have been hundred miles. Uh, and so that's what I was going to do. And then when I got on there and did and, and walked it, realized, no, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm planning on doing it uh, sometime this year uh, with a few of them. And my running friends just to, just because I was going to do it and then other things took over. Uh, so I, I, I knocked that on the head. Uh, and then I decided, which was even worse, I was going to, I was going to run from Kapil Keurig on the I-5 back to my house, which is, which is exactly 100 miles from Kapil Keurig, straight in the centre of Kapil Keurig, back to my house on the I-5. Is exactly hundred miles, and I was going to do that, and that's a, a pretty. Uh, I remember by this time I was getting further. I can remember I did a thirty mile run down down the I five. So I did a, an out and back on the I five, uh, and it scared me to death. Did I think it was thirty two miles. And I thought, there's no way I can do that because I'm, I'm going to end up dying because <laughs> cause it was really bad. The traffic was horrendous. And I thought, no, that, that's something else. Oh, oh. And then I was a bit of a, I was a bit of, bit of lost ends, to be fair. But I was still training because I was still going to run 100 miles 
by hook or by crook. Uh, and then I thought, well, I'll go and have a look at some of the ultras out there. And I looked at some of the ultras and I thought, these are really expensive. I thought, there's no way I can go to my wife and say, oh, I want to pay £150 or whatever to do a 100-mile race. Because uh, I know she would have said, she would have gone and said, go and do one. Uh, you can run 100 miles. <laughs> you can run around, you can run, you know, you can run around the park, do a, a route for, and do that a mile loop 100 times or whatever. And so I, I really knocked that on the head. So I was, so come, it would have been round about my time. I was at, I was at Lost End, so I'd, I'd run. I was getting quite far in my training. I'd gone over marathon distance by then. I was, you know, I was up to doing 35 miles on my long runs. And uh, I'd not done any. So I was running about three times a week with a long run at the weekend. And so I just kept doing that. Uh, but then, at this time, I was on Strava, and I noticed this lady who, who was following on there from Canuck. She got CCTR at the end of a name. And what I didn't realise at this time is people, runners put their initials for their running club or their running group at the end of the name. I thought it was some letters like the people do, <laughs> like when they've been to university, didn't they? Uh, and I just asked this lady, I messaged her, on one of her thing on a, one of her routes, and says what's CCTR, and she says it's Canic Chase Trail Runners. Uh, if you if you go if you if you put that into Facebook, you, you'll see the group and just go and ask to join. Uh, and I was a bit I was a bit apprehensive at this stage because I've I've not run with anybody at this point, and in my mind still I'm still this fat person, but I'm not. It, it's it's all in here, so. Uh, still struggling a bit with mental health at the same time. So, so meeting new people and 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 running with new people well was a big was a really big step forward. Uh, it took me a week to pluck the courage up. You know, I'm ready to do it. You know, but to pluck the courage up to 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 go and introduce myself on on a on this this running group page was, was, was a big ask, but I did it and just explained what I was doing. And, uh, and some people were like, wow, some people obviously uh, were like, yeah, who's this bloke coming along, you know, wanting to do 100 miles, like, you know, to stop the bat in 12 months seemed a bit, you know. But uh, one of the guys on there, his name's Ben Whittam, and he was just setting up uh, a company that's online. And it was like one-stop shop for everything fitness-wise. So all the races on there, everything, every sport you could think of, he was putting, collating it all together on one website that you, you could go there and type in and, and get. And it was called Active UK Leisure. And he, he messaged me. And says, I love your story. He said, I don't want you to run down the A5 because you're going to kill yourself. Uh, and he said, I'll sponsor you to do, I'll sponsor you to do your race. And I'll use your, your thing on my website. So I was like, okay, then. He'd been running about three or four years. Not done an ultra or anything, but he knew more than me about running <laughs> at this point. Uh, and so that's when I picked a race. So I got on. He told me to 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 put Run Ultra on. Uh, so I put I googled Run Ultra went in and and put I needed an hundred mile race uh, in September because then that would be a year, uh, and there wasn't much coming up. And I remember. Uh, after I put Run Ultra, GB Ultras come up on in the in the Google search, and I clicked on, and clicked through their through their website, and I noticed it got Snowden Ultra. Uh, so I clicked on that, clicked on the promo video. It had these people running through through Snowdonia. 
you know, 100 miles, 20, 24,000 feet in elevation. I watched the promo video and I was like, that's the race. <laughs> I can remember uh, direct messaging Ben back and saying, this is the race. And he was like, okay, then you want to do that. That's the race. And he said, I think you're mental uh, for your first, but if that's what you want to do, that's what. Well, well, what's the actual name of the ultra? It's called the uh, GB Ultras, uh, Snowden 1 Ultra. What Snowden 100 Ultra? And that, and and so I booked myself on uh, for the 18th of September. So it's like the end of April, coming up into May. What I didn't realise was that. <laughs> that for you to do a hundred, you need to qualify yourself, and either do a a fifty mile race beforehand, and which I didn't know anything about. Uh, and Ben says you need to go and check if you got to do a fifty beforehand. So I can remember going on to the uh, face uh, GB Ultras Facebook group and just. Putting a thingy on there. See, I'm planning on running the Snowden 100 uh, for my first ultra. Do you need to do a 50 mile race before that? And I just got all the messages just got laughed out of town. And they're like, no, you don't pick this for your first ultra. I had so many of the, the, the laughing faces on, on, that, on that one comment. It was just. I must have had about 70 laughing faces on it because there was like, but it was more fuel for my fire. So I realised that uh, I needed to do a 50. I went back to Ben and said, I've got to do a 50. He said, okay, I'll pay for that one as well. Go and pick another one for the 50. So I went and picked a 50, but I didn't pick a flat one. I, I didn't pick a flat one. I, uh, I went and picked the hardest one that I could find. Oh, we just lost your video there, mate. Is there a... Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's all right. My battery is running low. Uh, so I didn't pick a flat one or anything to ease me in. I went and... Uh, the, in, in Rich, June, let's, just, let's just point out. So the personal best, uh, the, the course record for this, the men's course record, Mar Martin Wilson... It's yeah. 30 hours, right? Yeah, yeah. To give people an idea, the Western States 100, which is a ninja race in, in the USA, some of the guys finished that in, in 18 hours. Yeah. So, so the, the, the record <laughs> for this is, is not far off double the time, so it, it really must be, um, <laughs> must be one hell of a course. Yeah, it, well, it is... Uh... <laughs> yeah, so I picked, I've picked that. Got laughed. It's two. Laughed it, I think. I think it's two thirds the height of Everest is what you're ascending. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is the race I wanted to do in a year, going from eighteen stuff. <laughs> uh, I've got up the, the furthest I've got up to my long runs is for, is is thirty five miles. Uh, and then I go just the start of May I go and pick a 50 miler to do this would be my first ever race uh, and instead of picking me one to ease myself into it I think well I'm doing a mountain ultra 100 mile ultra I need to do uh, a 50 that's going to train myself up to that so uh, I, I decide to do one go and do 50 miles where the, the SAS train down on the Brecon Beacons just, to, just to, to mix it up a bit. So that's where I did. I did uh, uh, Limitless Trails, uh, uh, 50 mile around the Black Mountains, 12 and a half thousand feet. So that was my first ever race. It was a 50 mile ultra race over the Black Mountains. It took me 16 hours. <laughs> <laughs> to do that's good going 
<laughs> so, so I'm hearing, I'm hearing the end of the end of I, April ga- going into May, and not really run any elevation by this point. But now I've signed up on two uh, two mountain races that is double what anything that I'd ever ever done before. So you tab in the army, yeah, you go up and down Penny Fan, but I've never run anything over ten miles in the army. I've walked, you know, you you walk all day, all night, whatever, with your kit, you know, with a lot of weights, but you, I've never run and so still no knowing me much about ultra running i put myself a plan together and start hitting and doing the reckies uh learn to eat on the go so learn how to hydrate myself learn how to to, to fuel myself but by this point as well i met other ultra runners at the canic chase trail runners i've got a wealth of experience of, of people there who really helped me. Uh, there's a few, there's a few who've, who've done like, un, have done a hundred milers. Uh, there's Rich, one can gentleman. We, can we just clarify? So you're still going to go for the Snowden 100, yeah? Yeah. I'm, I'll be honest. I'm just getting over like my anger that people were laughing at you. It's just so, uh, it, uh, this is the thing I hate about things like Facebook. Is <laughs> is is there's so many twats on there? Well, I, I can understand where they're coming from because it's probably in the top 10 hardest ultras in the country. It's in yeah, the top you're, 10. You're one of the top 10 hardest men in the country. So <laughs> it, 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 who cares about that? But they don't know that, do they? All they know is this some person who's trained and going from 18 stone to to... From that, like, from being a, an obese man to I, running I, a hundred mile ultra in a year. I guess it's the the the, the laughing faces that that's triggered me. Yeah, a bit, the, of, the a bit of you know, a bit of uh, constructive advice is fine, isn't it? But I I, 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 I did I did have a lot. I did have a lot of people who who give me a lot of good, really good feedback, and were like, "Yeah, I think you're crazy doing this, but I have really hope yeah. you know, good on you for." For, for doing it can i just um, I, I i just want to add in this sorry i I'm, I'm loving hearing your story and i'm sure the audience don't want me to keep interrupting but <laughs> it's just when i ran when i ran the length of the uk so thousand miles basically 999 miles carried a 15 kilogram rucksack like yourself slept by the side of the road um ran ultra marathon every day did no training at all right i might have r- run around the block or something. And I couldn't have done training rich because I've been disabled with a weight in a back operation for, for two and a half years. Right. Or two years. Can't, can't remember now. And the negativity I had to get over when I heard some of the most respected ultra runners that I know turn around and go, Oh no, you'll never do that. And I thought, no, I will. And this is where, this is why when I do my life coaching bit, I say, ignore the naysayers. They're judging what they think they can't do, not what you're capable of. And yeah, I mean, I had some serious old runners go, what? You're going to, no, 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 you don't, you don't want to. And I'm, and so, <laughs> yes, sorry, brother. Back, back, back but that- to you. For me, that's all fuel for my fire. Just keep, just bring it on because that, that, that feeds me, you know, it feeds the, uh, and, and so I've not really done any elevation really by this point. I've, I'm just, and then that's when it really got, it got serious. So I started, uh, doing a lot more hills, uh, like all the hills I could find, I would just go and, and run them. Uh, started doing recce because it was uh, a self-navigation. Uh, both of them was. Uh, and so I started doing the recce as, as well. Uh, and so for that, it was pretty intense. That month and a half 
before I did the 50 was just getting my body ready for what was going to, what was going to happen to it. And, and, uh, I can remember I had to get all this kit. So I had to buy a rice, get a, a rice vest. Uh, I bought some poles. I got all this stuff, all this manager kit that you had to have. Uh, I was learning how to fuel. I was reading these books. It was really, really intense training. I still really didn't really know what I was actually doing because I'd not actually done a race. I'd not actually, you know, I'd run as much as I could with the, with the people around here from the Canic Chase Trail Runners, tried to glean as much knowledge from people who had, who had done ultras, but it, it's still... There's no, there's no book. There's no nobody had ever has knocked up a training plan from going from <laughs> from doing from from couch to hundred miles in a year. No, <laughs> there, there wasn't no training plan for me to follow. So it was just thinking what would be best for me, and then going and and doing it. And it was a lot of trial and error. So I get to the to the day of. The night before the race, I remember going down there and uh, like I'd already done part of the course. So I'd done like first half of the course. I'd done the first 25 miles. So I knew the first 25 miles. Uh, <laughs> I remember going down there though and, and – uh, doing the kit check and everything and, and doing the registration the night before. And then uh, my wife says, go in the house. Like, so I went in the holiday in for my first, my first one. I remember, uh, I remember clicking on and watching a bit of YouTube. And I remember watching a guy named Rhys Jenkins, ultra runner. And he, he'd set the FKT for the, for the, the Welsh Coast Path. And I watched him the night before. I remember turning up at, I think it was four o'clock, half past four uh, at the race start. And as I'm walking down, this guy, Reese Jenkins, is walking up. And uh, I, go, I know you. I watched you last night uh, doing your, doing your he's on, on YouTube. He's like, which one? And that was like me thinking, which one, how many more has he done? How many more things there he's done? And uh, and he said, and I was like, the, the cow's path one. He went, oh, yeah, done that. And I was like, are you racing today? He's like, yeah, this is probably, this is, I'm racing today. He said, I've just moved around here and, and, and this will be my first race in the area. And some of mine's just gone, you know. I've just watched this blow do 50 miles a day and set the FKT for the Welsh Coast Path. And now he's running in the in the race, but he was a really nice bloke, give me some some good advice and everything, not to go off fast, and even though I did, uh, not to go off fast and fuel off and all, all the stuff that they they tell the the, the, the newbies. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was like rocked up. I was in these decathlon trainers, Paying the government trainers, all the you know the stuff. I just looked raw as it was, and I remember seeing all these cool other ultra runners. Uh, but luckily to me, then that night before, I met a guy named Ian. I spoke to him, told him my story, and then on the on the day, on the day of the race start, I'm there, and I just got this imposter syndrome, you know. Uh, what am I doing here? It's just going from my mind. What am I doing here? Well, I've got all these people with all this, like, all kits. You can tell that they've, some of them have done them all before, you know. And I was just like, this Reese Jenkins guy I'd seen on YouTube's here running it as well. I was like, what am I going to do? And I was just like, I'm going to pull out. I'm going to pull out. Luckily, Ian, this guy who I met the night before, looked at me, saw that I was petrified and goes, are you okay? And I was like, he was like about five feet away and he just shook me head and now he's like, come here, come here. He says, start with me. He says, don't go off fast. Okay. Start with him, settle my nerves and, and we go off fast. Now, the first mile, 
you probably do about a thousand feet in the first. It was just straight uphill, straight away. And so I just go off us. I lose, I lose Ian, and I just go off. Don't know what I'm doing, like a headless chicken. But luckily, about, about five or six miles in, I get lost because it got foggy. And he got lost, and we end up meeting up with each other. And so for the for the next 30 miles, I run with him. So when he fuels, I fuel, and we have a laugh when he... And it was a really good experience. But round about the 32, 33 mile mark, my whole body just starts to shut down. My knees are just gone. I just feel really bad, feel ill. My, I just can't run anymore. So I just start walking. And I tell him just to go on. And this other bloke who's running with us, I'm okay, just go on. But I knew inside that I was really up against it. So for the last 15 miles, I don't do any running. I just walk <laughs> the last 15 miles. Uh, luckily for me, I meet another Another chap, uh, Rob Smith, his name is, and he's a, a doctor of psychology at, at, uh, at Cardiff University. It's like you meet all these, like, you know, and we, we spend the next five and a half hours together <laughs> walking this ultra. This down and out ex-veteran with no education, <laughs> uh, chewing the fat with, with a doctor in psychology who's the nicest bloke I'd ever met. Uh, luckily for me, he was training for UTMB. For people who don't know, it's the it's like the world, it's like the World Cup of ultra running race, and he's doing it the year on for his training for it. But luckily for me, he'd done a hundred k race the week before and done this fifty, and so he's he's like he's training on tired legs, and he just starts getting tired, and that's how we meet up, and so. I can remember doing the last the last 15 miles with with Rob Smith and just learning so much about ultra running that I didn't know. And we what we were doing, what he termed, and that other term is the death march together. You're that tired that you're not running no more, you're just you're just walking. So we're just doing the elevation as well. And uh, and it was just it's just so hard, but such a wonderful experience at the same time. I just dug in and just tabbed and, and, and it was hard, but it, it was one of the hottest days of June as well. <laughs> it was like it was red hot and just the course was, you can imagine what it's like up the Black Mountains. It was up and down, up and down. And I just remember... I think we got a couple of miles out, and by this point, he, my legs stopped working. And Rob thinks that I'm behind him, but I'm not. I've just gone slower and slower and slower. And I was about a mile and a half out, and I couldn't hardly walk. I'd gone down to, I don't know, some ridiculous slow time. I can, I'm, I'm just hobbling. You know, when you've like, you've been tabbing for days on end and you've got shin splints and your feet are hurting. It was that sort of sensation. You're just hobbling. I was just hobbling in. Every, every, every all the paints in each joint, they, all the pain joins up, doesn't it? Everything was hurting. I've gone yeah. from that race. We've like, your body plays tricks on yourself. Your, your, your hip joint will suddenly start eating, but hurting. But then it'll go again, then your knee joint will start hurting, then that'll go again. Mm -hmm. But by the end of it, by like by 48 miles, everything is hurting. I've <laughs> everything is killing. I've expanded how much pain relief I could have. So I was just like, I was just in that hurt locker. It was everything was just hurting. And a couple of miles before that, some of the race organizers had seen me and said, Do you want to give up? And I was like, fuck no, I'm not giving this up. I've got to do this race so I can do this this insane other race. In, in two months' time, I've got to do this race. It was my stepping stone. <laughs> and so 
But the camaraderie on there was just unbelievable. Uh, Ian, who I'd seen, told his wife, met his wife on the course. She'd come out and she'd, I met her at one of the checkpoints, obviously Ian had, had run on and she'd gone and bought me coke from the, from the pub just down the road because I really could do with, because I was really tired. She's like, I'll get you some Coca-Cola. She went and bought me a pint in a pint glass from the pub <laughs> across the road. And uh, I'm starting to well up now. He knows I'm coming in because he's Rob's coming to see him. So he's come walking up to see where I am. And these other people start walking up and they like start cheering me. And then my body starts to work again. It was like just needed that sort of kick to get my body working again. And so I, I'm still hobbling by this time. I'm not running. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing anything really quick or anything. I've just got enough momentum now to get in. And they're like, and then Rob, he's waiting at the finish line for me. And he won't finish until I finish, until we finish together. So uh, we finished together and it was just, just well, I'd say everybody cheering. I think there's about 10 people there. Because, <laughs> you know, with ultras, there's not many who start. So there's not, there's not many people on the course, you know. I think there's about, there about 10 people there, but it was like finishing with Rob and like Rob waiting for me to finish together was just, it's just unbelievable. And it was just like, these people really care. It's like, because these things are so hard. It's, they've got this, this spirit of camaraderie there that I mean, can remember when I blew up. I can remember a woman. I can see her two mountains away. And I can see her. And she's catching up with me. You know, every time she's getting closer and closer. And I remember getting to me and uh, she was like, are you okay? And I'm like, I, I'm like, I'm struggling. I said, it's my first ultra. I tell her what, and she was like, she's like, this is unbelievable. And she was like, do you want me to stay with you until we get to another checkpoint? So I was like five miles away from a checkpoint. And uh, I'm like, no, you carry on. You carry on because you're like really unbeknown to me. She was the first female, and I think she come fourth in the race. She was willing to give up her race to help me to get to a checkpoint. And I was just like, just dumbfounded, gobsmacked, because there's no other sort of racing that people would put themselves out there for you when they see that you are struggling. If that was on a marathon, they'd just run past you, wouldn't they? Yeah. I've got to get a PB. I've got to do this, that. She was willing to give up her race and her position and a, and a few other women past me. So she would have, you know, she wouldn't have been, might not have been first woman. I just, um, in the race. I just <laughs> add my 10 pence worth, if I may, is, is it's a very funny sport. Like I, I did, I did a hundred miler, actually ended up running 107 miles and, about 10 miles in rich there was a girl just walking along crying <laughs> you know what a sport where someone's crying while they're competing <laughs> and i put you know run up put my arm around, are, are you are you okay can i do anything oh I've, I've i've taken on i've done this before you know i have finished this before i'm like yeah i'm sure you have but you you'll you'll finish it this time yeah and you could just see her head was it's, it's it's all it's mostly mental, isn't it? And her head wasn't yeah. in the right. All it was is her head, not the fitness. We've all got that. Anybody, if you actually had to do hundred miles, if your life depended on it, you you'd be surprised how many people would find yeah. a way, right? Definitely, yeah. Definitely. The other thing, the other thing, Rich, is um, when you get to some of those a tents, especially about four o'clock in the morning. And they've got the fan blower, the heat, fan heater thing, hopefully blowing on you if it's cold. And you, you're getting a couple of snacks and stuff. And there's all these people laid out in deck chairs that have given up. And some of them are way fitter than you. 
And yeah. some of them, some of them you've been running with for like the last 25, you ran 25 miles of the race with, and then you had a good banter and they've got all the kit and they're fit and they, they're called sporty. And it's just that the mind gives up and they just stop and wait, wait for the, what we call in the military, the rat wagon to come and pick them up, to take them back to the finish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it was, it is all, it's, it is all mental. It's, it's, if you've got a strong force of will, it doesn't matter how fit you are, you, you can't complete these races. It, it, it's just having that doggy determination that you're not going to give up or however hard it, it gets. But once I've done that race, now I'm on to, I've got 50 more miles to do. We've over, we've had, we've another 12,000 feet more elevation mm. with a 48 hour cut off. Yeah, so it was a different beast altogether. 12,000 feet more in elevation and 50 miles. So I was up against it. So the training, realised that I needed to change the training. Uh, so I hit the gym. I needed to strengthen all my ligaments, everything up. So it was it was strength training that, that I, I focused on. And then my recce's over in Snowden. First time I got there, I was just, I can remember doing Trifan for the first time and thinking to myself, OMG, what have I done? What have I let myself in for? So it was really windy and I forgot that I'm scared of heights and I don't like, you know, like being up there. And I remember trying to find Heather Terry for the first time and thinking to myself, what have I done? But I carry on and Intense again. All the training was really intense, really intense. That's it. Basically, consumed me. All I was after was focusing on was completing that race and getting that belt buckle. That's all I thought about. It just consumed the next two months, and so I did everything possible to get me to that point to be able to to get on that race. I knew, I knew. I wouldn't be placing. I knew I was just there to complete and survive it. That's what I knew. And that's what I got my body ready to do, to be able to to face this onslaught that it, that it would have. But then straight away, I was into it. I had got the first 10 miles out the way. Fine. Got to the first checkpoint. I felt fine. I just felt, oh, I needed to go to the toilet. Uh, got in the toilet and just exploded <laughs> everything I don't know what I did or it was it nerves or whatever just all come out of me and I was just uh, it, I was just drained and then my stomach hurt that much I couldn't keep no food down I couldn't keep no drink down so for the next bear in mind I'd got I was just about to hit Trifan go on to up over the glider plateau, up Snowden, down Snowden, back up onto the gliders round, and then down onto Penny Alwen. That would that was the first 30 miles. I couldn't eat anything. I can remember I was that slow going up Trifan that I thought I'm going I can't do this. I can't do it. I've got another, I've got like another 80 miles to go. <laughs> or was it 85 miles to go? I was like, I'll just thought in my mind I can't do this I can't do this I can remember getting up to the top down and starting going up Snowden I was going that slow I'd got my poles I'd not eaten I'd gone through two checkpoints where I'd not eaten and uh, not drunk I was that just just so weak I couldn't it's like in the middle of summer and all these people are going up Snowden. I feel this hand put on my back. And this little old lady <laughs> goes, oh, come on, you're doing ever so well. Come on, you'll be able to get up here, no problem. And I was like, oh, thank you for that. And she just toddles off with her walking sticks with this backpack on. And she beats me up Snowden. I was going that slow. 
that an old lady on a day out beat me up Snowden. <laughs> that was one of my defining moments on the race, was being beat to the top of Snowden. I could see her in the distance and I was trying to catch up with her and I couldn't catch up with her. <laughs> couldn't catch up with her. And, uh, and so I get up to the top of Snowden and I'm still, still up against it. Just, I'd never, I'd never had this before in any of the training. I never had where I'd, I'd had problems in my stomach or fueling or hydrating myself. And now in the race of my life that I've spent all year training for to do, and I've got these problems and I don't know what to do. And, and uh, I've tried these settlers. I've tried all these things. Uh, I remember getting back down to the other checkpoint. So I get to the third checkpoint now. So I'm, and so I'm about 25 miles in, just summited snow and got down, ready to go up onto the gliders or the gliders, whatever you call them. And uh, somebody just says to me, Why not? have you ever tried crisps? I said, what do you mean? It's like, get crisps, scrunch them up in the bag, get some water, get the crisps, chuck some in and then drink the water straight away. And I can remember doing that. And I can remember retching some of it back up, but some of it stopping down. And that was the first water and food that I ha I'd had from, from my breakfast at four o'clock in the morning. And like I was well into it now, about five or six hours. So I'd gone all that. And then, but anything I ate or drunk was still making my stomach hurt. And so... Do the gliders, get to the Ogwen Valley, ready to go up Penny Owen. Luckily for me, that they didn't go up Penny Owen because I knew if I'd have gone up that, I think that would have probably crushed me because it's just, it's like that up with a bit of climbing as well. And, uh, but they didn't stay uh, for some reason. They, I think it was the, uh, Mountain Rescue had told the race organisers that if anybody would, they'd send him up there, they wouldn't go and rescue anybody uh, just because of how many people were out on snow down here that day. Uh, and so, but it being snow down here, they did the low level route, but the low level route is in some places is still hard as the, the normal route because it's snow down here. <laughs> and I can remember getting. I remember getting to about the the 30 mile point and meeting up with this guy. Concurrently, you've got the 50 milers who start and they're after you, but because they're only doing 50 mi miles, they, they're running quicker, aren't they? You know, they're getting through it quicker. And I remember uh, uh, all these 50 mile people coming past me and I remember this one chap uh, struggling a bit, he, he got the wrong sort of footwear on and he couldn't keep up. Like, like he kept falling over around his ankle. He'd never done a mountain ultra before. So this both of our first sort of things on the mountains. Uh, Kevin, his name was. But I thought his name was Billy and spent the next 15, <laughs> about, the, about the next five hours calling him Billy, even though his name was Kevin. <laughs> I don't know if I was delirious or not, but, but uh, yeah, so I get to 50 miles and by this point, I probably had probably a packet of crisps and maybe a few M&Ms. And so I'm really dehydrated and, and obviously I'm famished, but can't keep much in. And I can remember uh, Kevin saying to me, saying, I don't think you should go on. He says, I can't see you doing this. And I can remember him going to the race organiser and saying, you, sh you shouldn't let him ca carry on. And I remember one of the race organisers coming over to me and saying, are you OK? I'm like, I'm not stopping. I'm, I'm, I'm carrying on. I'm ready to do this next 50. 12 o'clock at night, so it it taken, it taken me 24 hours to do 50 miles. Near enough. I think it was 
Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, I think I got in there about 11 o'clock at night. And, uh, and so I carried on, uh, changed my clothes and, and carried on. Uh, but I did start to eat more and I started to get stronger. Like at the last checkpoint, I did, I ate a pot noodle, three bags of crisps and two chocolate bars <laughs> at the last checkpoint at, uh, at, uh, where is it? Bed Gellert. Uh, but obviously you're going into, like you said, just the course record is 30, is 30 hours on this. But it's an insane, you know, an ins you know, really good elite runners. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and so what I didn't take into account was the hallucinations that would come. And the sleep deprivation, it was just, it was just unbelievable. Tackling this while you snow down, it's so technical, running, hiking, whatever. It's, it's like anywhere. I don't think there's nowhere else like it in this country. Maybe Helvellyn and a few others, maybe in, in the, in the Scottish Islands, but Snowden, you know, there's parts of Snowdon, and especially with the slight as well, you know. The, the, the next half, the next 50 miles of, of, the, of, of the race, the elevation is still the same. It's just that you're going through slight mines and up, and up mountains that are technically are just slight because of being, obviously because of, 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 of the area. And so that was just horrendous. But luckily for me, uh, I teamed up with a, a guy named James Brown and I learned a lot from him. What I learned was when you're feeling good and you've had some food and you feel good, not to push yourself because you're going to, before you know it, you're going to be back into feeling low again. And what I realised is these highs and lows can come in within an hour, mm. even 20 minutes, one minute. You're like, you're like, yes, so you can conquer anything. The next minute you're crying on the floor thinking that I can't do this. And it just like up and down so much. And I, I just learn from him that you don't push it as much you, you, you've already gone past the stage where you are competing but you are just surviving to get through the race uh, and I can remember us doing this and I can remember going into the second night we've already been out a night now we're going into our second night and hallucinating I can remember uh, <laughs> I can remember starting to get up to get onto my old seabod and it, the route that it takes, it like goes up in stages. And I can remember looking and thinking, somebody must have, have uh, drones out or something. I said, because all these drones, we like to keep moving everywhere. And I'm like, ain't that really weird? And, uh, and I says, can you see this to James? He's like, yeah, I can see it. And I'm like, isn't that weird that somebody would be out on the mountains at like two o'clock in the morning with these drones, with lights on? What I didn't really realise is I'm hallucinating and it's their stars <laughs> fixed, but it's me because I'm moving and because I'm hallucinating. I think there's people up there <laughs> with drones. And so I'm just like... Just by this time, I'm just done. Our navigation, obviously, I'm using my handheld. He's using his watch. And because they're so small, these watches are, like, really small. My handheld, my, my Garmin E-Trex is, like, you know, a couple of centimetres. And we're hallucinating, trying to see which way to go. It was just, I think, for a, a lot of the time, we just went round in circles, like, in between these. Because to get on to me, I'll see, but you go have these, like, three little mini mountains to get there and I think we was just like like doing a figure of like in between we must have because we spent so much time but I remember getting up onto the last mountain me I'll see but and there's all these lights down in the valley and I remember watching them and the next minute these lights stand up and they're like two big robots 
and they start dancing and they're like really big, like 50 meters high. And I just think to myself, I need to sleep. I need to sleep. All I can see from these mountains are these robots, like Daft Punk robots from the 90s <laughs> doing these dances. And I'm just like, this is just horrendous. I'm just so tired, so hungry. But I now just, I've just got to keep going. But then we get up on the, on the last mountain and we can't get back down. And we're hallucinating. And I, I think we spent a, quite a bit of time up there. And uh, I can remember getting a signal and James ringing the race organisers and saying, we know where you are because we've been watching you and you've spent, you need to get off the mountain. And we were starting to get cold as well. And I could feel that if we don't get off this mountain soon, we're going to go down. Because mm. uh, it already been raining. We've already got our, uh, you know, thermals on and stuff. So I've got nothing else left to put on. I've got everything on. And so I've stopped and I'm getting cold trying to get off this mountain. I hate, and I hate that. What you, you just, you've got to keep running because if you stop, you're going to get hypothermia. You, you can, you're going to go down. Mm. So, but we were like headless chickens anyway, because we were just like moving, uh, moving around. And, uh, but we do get down and the race, uh, Wayne Drinkwater, who's the, the head of GB Ultras, he personally comes onto the mountain and helps us get back down, which, you know, for me was like, I've met all these people and they're like, for, for him to come in, I oh, know he's, he's going to do it anyway because, you know, he doesn't want people dying on his races. It's not, it's not good for, it's not a good advertisement, is it? Or maybe it might be, you know, that it's badass. Or whatever, but he comes and helps us off. And I can remember getting on, getting down off the mountain and uh, kept seeing all these little people uh, running around and running by James. And I'm like, these people, are these little people are after you. And he's like, there's nobody there. You are hallucinating. And then he starts to remember running in. We're about three and a half, four miles away from the finish. Uh and we're running down the road into uh, into Betsy <laughs> And James, he's about 20 metres in front of me. He suddenly darts across the road and looks over the, into a ditch and starts talking. And I'm like, are you talking to James? He's like, are oh, these people here? And I'm like, there's nobody there. And he keeps doing this all the way down this road. And I tell you what, I've never laughed so much in my life watching this this guy from Liverpool uh, just like talking in this mad scouse accent to people that's not there. It was hilarious. And I was just like, I was just laughing so much. I was just like, it was just really comical, but it's like trying to explain to people. You just you had to be there to like see. But and and so we're a good few. We're a good three or four hours off the 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 cutoff, so we think that we are fine. Uh, but then I start to get really slow, and he just goes off uh, and leaves me because he's hallucinating anyway. But he's still taking, uh, he's still loose enough to to follow his way around and stuff. It's just you just go off in little tangents when you know when because you are so tired. And we get separated from each other. And I don't know, it's because I'm getting to the end and I, oh, my whole body relaxes. I just uh, I just start to go really slow, really, really slow. And I can remember looking at my watch, thinking I'm nearly at the end. I remember looking down at my watch and seeing that I've got two hours to go and I've still got like two and a half miles to do. And uh, my friend who was watching me on the tracker uh, says that I must have done the last two miles in some like 10 minute miles. And this is like, I oh, were really technical. I've, I'm, you know, I'm like, I've That's been away. Incredible. Over 50 hours and I do my last two miles. I can remember running by the river and somebody who's obviously from from the race, from the, the finish, comes out to meet me 
uh, halfway down. And, and so he leads me in. And I can remember getting into Betsy Coward. And it's like five o'clock in the Monday morning. And I've got, and I beat the cut off by uh, 54 minutes. <laughs> so my, so my first ever 100 mile ultra, I finish at Betsy Coward, <laughs> five o'clock Monday morning. And there is three people there. There's me, James Brown, who, who waited for me again, another person who waited for me to finish together. And one of the race organisers. So this thing that has consumed my life for a year, when I finish, there's three people there and it's raining, Betsy Co, and there's like dustmen, but you know, there's people, road sweepers out and they're like looking. And I can remember just finishing and just... They give me the buckle, take the picture, and I can just remember looking at this buckle, and I'm just on my own after doing this race that's just been my whole life. And I just thought to myself, I started it on my own, and I finished it on my own, and I was there, and it was just like the sun was coming up. It's a bit drizzly, but it was like, and I remember just sitting there, just thinking, I've done it. I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. It's taken me two days to do, but I've done it. I've bet the cut out, I've come last. <laughs> I'm last, but I've done it. I think there was about six people behind me, five and four, between, between four and six people behind me who who didn't get the cut off. Mm. Uh, but I was determined to, 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 to get that cut off. And I can remember being helped to my car because I could once I'd sat down, I couldn't walk after that. Uh, this the lady who was there, she helped me to a car. I just get in my car. I don't do anything. I just get my sleeping bag, wrap it around me, and I crash out there and then. I don't move the seat back or anything. I can remember just crashing out. I can remember waking up at twelve o'clock with my face on the steering wheel, and. And because I'm facing, and these, these kids played on the park, and I've just like <laughs> woken up from this race, just been flat out and just uh, feeling really hungry. I go and get the biggest ice cream I've ever seen. It cost me seven pounds, big, massive ice cream. <laughs> I eat that ice cream and go back to sleep and wake up at five, at five o'clock. Unbeknownst to me, because my phone's on silent, I remember starting back, looking at my phone, clicking it off silent, and it's just rattling, <laughs> like that. And my, and my, the eldest daughter says, don't look at your phone. He says, but it's going mental. You've just like broken the internet. There's so many people following you on all these pages, on these fitness sites. They're just following you. They're just like, everything's, just sharing, and I can remember uh, sending me, because I don't know how to use Instagram. It's only been the last month that I've started to get serious with Instagram. And uh, she showed me where all my stuff on Instagram, where it's been gone, where it's been, and it's gone everywhere. It's gone everywhere. And I can remember finishing and stopping, buying a kebab. And it's quite so poignant, because what I used to do, when I was really fat, my wife would go to bed and I would come here and I would, on just eat, I'd order myself a kebab and I'd go and get it and not tell my wife. And so every night if I'd have my dinner, I'd have a kebab. And I remember this would be my first kebab that I've had <laughs> in 12 months. I remember just gorging on this kebab. And uh, I can remember just this one message from my grandson, Tyler. Just saying, Grandad, I'm so proud of you for what you've done. And he'd like a 13 year old boy to put that on Facebook about his granddad. My granddad's just run 100 miles. I'm so proud of you, Grandad. Was just, just thinking of it now, just makes me well up. And just now that the influence that I'm having on him 
And then I didn't realise how much influence that I had on other people. And then it just got just crazy people asking me for advice and stuff. And I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know. Really, my wife said, don't give any advice out because all you know, what you've done is just for, for you, really. She says, hey, <laughs> so they can you give people advice unless they're another mentalist like you who's, who's going to do <laughs> another catch to 200 mile ultra in 12 months. And I suppose she's right in some ways, but the knock on effect is that. And then that's not the end of it either. I end up uh, thinking I need to. Well, I didn't have any plans doing anything for charity really until on Facebook I saw uh, Combat Stress doing their marathon in a month. And I thought, okay, I looked on that. I thought, I'll do this. And I thought to myself, Brock and run a marathon anyway. Like a month and a half ago, I'd I'd run a hundred miles, uh, but I'd not run much since then because my body was just shredded. It was just it it, it took a pounding. Uh, but then I think to myself, you could do you could bang out a marathon and do it in the first day, and I was like, but then there's another twenty nine days. And I just have this, this thought, why don't you do 30 marathons in 30 days? And then, so I'll put it out on Facebook what I'm going to do. And then I don't realise the maps. There it's like some insane, like 700 miles in a month. You know, 26 miles a day for 30 days is just like, but I'd already put it on Facebook and I'd already got, donations for it so i couldn't really did you do that like were you able to do that in loose order so you you, you came home every night yes yeah, so so yeah so the first week was horrendous because for a month and a half i'd not really done any sort of big running at all it was just little short stuff trying to get myself back into some kind of sort of shape so can I, I remember, sorry, Rich, I should just ask, how long did, how long did your recovery take? Because I, I, I asked, because I lost, um, I think it was dehydration. I lost the feeling in my left toes. And I think it's because when you get dehydrated, it takes, your body takes water from your discs in your spine and it cramped down on some nerve. And I lost the feeling in my toes. They didn't come back for almost a year. Uh, I think I was back running in about two weeks. Uh, but I was really dehydrated. I'd lost, I'd lost nearly a stone in two days because <laughs> of not having those issues, fueling issues and hydration issues at the start. Really took its toll. But yeah, I was back running, but not much, you know, two or three miles, you know, and then I'd get tired. Uh, and so it took took me a good month and a half to, to like recover to some semblance. But I'd, I'd not put any long runs in. I'd not done any sort of mileage. If you go and have a look on my Strava, like, like September and October, is, there's just nothing there. So I'll start put it on and like we've been like one of my friends says like he said that went quick didn't he because I was watching that you put oh, I'm going to do a marathon I'm going to do a marathon and do it in one day and then within an hour I'd gone the, from doing that to doing 30 marathons in 30 days it like you know it accelerated really quick I just started clicked and so the first week was just horrendous it was like as if what are you doing it like somebody just hit me with a sledgehammer, my body was just screaming out, what are you doing, man? But I was doing them on the chase. So there was all trail running. There was no roads. It was just with elevation as well. So the second week was probably the hardest. Uh, everything was hurting. I've got shin splints, puffed up ankles. Uh, I'd, got, I'd only got one set of trainers that would fit me 
all the others I couldn't fit into because my because of my uh, my feet and my ankles had just blown up, and it was just like woof. And so, <laughs> and it took about about ten to fifteen miles for everything to warm up before it'd stop hurting. Uh, but a couple of those mar a couple of those marathons, I think it was the Tuesday and the Wednesday of that second week, that every step hurt. And I think it took me, I was doing something like pitiful, like 13, 14 minute. Yeah, mate, we've all been there. It was just, it was just horrible. You know, I'd expanded what I could take uh, in, in pain relief wise. So I'd be like, you know, uh, messing up my liver or kidneys or whatever. So I just had to grin and bear it. But by the third week, Everything could settle down. It was like by the end of the third week, it was it was like as if my body had gone, okay, you're doing this now. This is what we're doing. I'm just gonna get everything ready so you can you can do it. And it was like all the swelling, it didn't go totally, but it it a lot of it went, the shin spins went, and nothing was hurting. It was really really weird i'd got slower over the over the month i'd gone from like doing like my my aim was to do 10 minute miles so that's like four and a half hour marathon which i thought was you, you know that was uh and so i by by the end of it and the snow had come then in the Midlands, the end, end of November, it, within a couple of days, it just, so the last, apart from the last one, I think I did about four days where I was trudging in the snow and they took me between six and seven hours to do, mm -hmm. to do the marathons each day. Uh, but I didn't realise how many, how other, I took other people on the journey as well, people from a running club, people uh, got invested in what I was doing. And it was like, it was just, it was just mental. Eh? But most of the marathons I did were on my own. And there was, you know, Brian Wood. I yes. think he, yeah, yeah. He been was on doing his 20, been on the podcast. He was doing his 25 marathons at the same time I was doing my 30 marathons. And he had... Everybody out with him. I didn't. He might have even had the Queen out with him. I don't know. He had that many people. There was school children. He's going past schools. I've done most of mine. Most of mine were done. Apart, I'd say five were done with other people there. My mate Ian come up from from uh, Bristol and did two with me. Uh, I'd had a lot of the runners from round here come and done some with me, but the major amount of them were done on my own on the chase. And he had all these people. He was on, you know, good morning, Britain, most days. And there was me, <laughs> little me, on my own doing all these marathons. <laughs> and he's got all, he'd got all these vans following him and he was having a massage. I had nothing. <laughs> hey, mate, if you, if, if, no disrespect to Brian, he's a one, wonderful guy. He's a great, yeah, he's a war hero, so, you know. But, 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 was, but I, let, I just, let, let's just remember that, that mainstream media. Yeah shy away from PTSD because they yeah. don't want to, they don't want to admit the truth that most soldiers in the British forces are quite damaged. And, and, um, and shall I tell you what, respect to, to him because he, he did that. You can, he, I, I, he was broken at the runner. end, wasn't he? Yeah. I become a runner. That's, that was what I was doing. That's what and I don't think he was, you know, so I think, all credit to him. He, he after he'd done his, he 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 shared my stuff on on Instagram and social media. He didn't why he was doing it, which I can understand, because uh, obviously he's doing it for he's not doing it for combat stress. But he did after he did share my stuff after, and we did chat together on why we were doing it as well. So over to him, it was good. It, it was just the 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 two sort of extremes where 
he's got all these people running and the publicity and I was just little old me doing it sort of thing. It was just, I could see it was just uh, the two extremes of it. But like at the end, after I did it, it was like, what do I do now? <laughs> Part of me wanted to like, like, couldn't wait to finish that I could wake up in the morning and know that I'm not going to do 26.2 miles that day. But then there was another half of me that still wanted to go out there and did it. So I've not really, I think I've had five days off from running since November and I've just carried on. I've just carried on running again. Wow. So, so that's my, that was my year. Uh, just, just when I think back, it's just crazy. I think it's, well, um, it, yeah, it, it's one <laughs> thing to sort of start getting fit and do an ultra, but to come from such a, a dark place and then have the challenge of getting over an addiction and losing so much weight to be able to put yourself in a position to be in the game and then to get your head straight in that game to run a hundred miles. Um, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and the, the crazy thing is, and pe people who haven't been through either challenge or, or, or ultra or, or probably would have trouble understanding this, that the mental is so much tougher than the physical. Well, one of, one of my... physical's <laughs> hard. One of my inspirations uh, is a, a bloke uh, from our running group num named Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Roberts, and he's done some, he's done some, he's ex-army himself, and he's done some, some main ones, and he come up to me, and he come up to me and said, once you've done this, he said, it's either going to knock you two ways, it's either going to knock you, where you're going to want to do it, and that's you, or you're not going to do it again. He said, I hope it's going to be the other one. But I think it is it is the other way because now I've, I've, I've signed up for some more, <laughs> some more crazy, crazy races. Uh, so what I do think you think about getting into the Western States then? Because I had a look into it and it seems quite convoluted. You've got to have all yeah. these times in your own country in a recognised ultra. You might have that. You might be able to apply. But then, of course... I, I was supposed to be in the MD, MD, MDS, so the Marathon de Sables last year. Yeah. Supposed to, and I was, I was effectively banned with everybody else that won't get, that, you know, has chosen not to be vaccinated. Um, the same again this year. It's a wee bit, it feels all quite wrong, if you ask me, because there's no requirement to go to Morocco to be vaccinated, right? This is something the race have done off okay. their own. They, they think in their minds they're protecting their own. But, of course, I've got to be careful what I say here, but, um, but you know. Well, I'm, I, I'm, not qualified, I'm not qualified for the Western States. I think you have to do a certain race in this country. Mm. You have to do that. Uh, so I, I, well, the point I was saying, mate, is I don't know... What the wet? It's everything's just become complicated now. You used yeah. to, be able to do what what you wanted anywhere in the world yeah. when you wanted to. Now certain of us don't have that freedom anymore, which is that's just a whole another <laughs> another subject uh, uh, again. Um, but the Western states, I, I'd love to have a go, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. I, I would I'd love to have a go, uh, but I think. I think I love doing uh, doing like Alpine ultras. So I've uh, I've signed up to do the Ultra Trail Snowden, which is 103 miles with with 33,000 feet in in, in, in that's July. Double, that's double what you've done, isn't it? That's double the elevation. It 
I did 24 on the, it's, but it, it's like, it's so, I did 24 on, on this Snowden and, and Ultra Trail Snowden, uh, which is under UTMB, it's in their World Series now, is an extra, yeah, it's an extra 16,000 feet and what I did on this, on this one. And I think you, I think you get the two extra hours. So there's a fifty hour cut off. So I'll be doing that in July. Uh, and so <laughs> I've not just like gone and thought, okay, I'll I'll just do some local ultras. I've gone probably for probably for the hardest alpine race uh, in the country. Good. Uh, do you how do you think you would get on with, let's say, a fairly flat, because nothing's ever quite flat. I did the Robin Hood 100, and they say that it's pretty flat, and it, and it was. It, it was pretty much like as flat as a running track, most of it. But the reason I'm asking is one of the holy grails in ultra running is to do the 124 hours, isn't it? Hey. Um, how do you think you'd fare on a set, on a sort of flat course i don't i don't know uh, i don't know i might i'll give it a go mm. <laughs> i definitely i definitely i think that i think that would be i don't know uh, i think you probably i think we've with the alpine stuff and the mountain stuff uh, there's a lot of speed hiking you know, and the, the the approach to the train is probably totally different to what you would do for a for an ultra where there is more running. Where whereas in those it is, you know, you can't run up well you can uh run up certain parts of Snowden. Uh, but there's some mountains where you can't you can't run. <laughs> you've got to you've got to hike or you've got to climb mm. uh or scramble. Uh, and so I've not done that. So, but it will see because before before then, I'll give a plug. A plug. Uh, I'm doing my own backyard ultra in March for from MND Association. Uh, is, it? By, is it mountain neurons disease? Okay. Association, uh, I see uh, somebody from our old regiment, an old salt major, he's, he's got it. And so a lot of them were, I think there's about 30 of them doing the uh, the Goggins 4x4 48 challenge. But I, R- remind, but us what, remind us what that is. So you run four hours, uh, you run four miles every four hours for 48 hours. Okay. Now I did that last year as a preparation for for what I was doing. So I didn't want to do that again. So I've decided while they're doing that, I'm going to do a backyard ultra. So I'm going to run four four miles on the hour every hour. Now that will yeah. take you up to 100 miles in 24 hours. Yeah. So we'll see if I can do if I can do. 100 miles in 24 hours on a four mile loop in March. <laughs> it's just, uh, I'm, it's really funny. I'm planning the same thing. I've got, because I can't do the marathon from the sands now, I don't even know what's going to happen with my, en- my entrance to that. Um, I'm, I've had my eye, there's a, re- one of my favorite runs is around a reservoir near us and it's, it's almost it's almost exactly four miles. It's just slightly less, so you'd have to kind of do a little off and then back on again just to make up yeah. that zero point two, which is no sweat. And there's a few elevations, but they're nothing nothing ninja. And I I really want to have a crack at the hundred miles in twenty four hours. Um, yeah. Oh. But I'm gonna. And- I'm gonna. I'm just gonna keep going. My my target is for them is to do the forty eight hours. So 
while they're doing their running every four hours, four miles, I want to to see if I can keep up doing four miles every hour. Good luck. I, I know Matthew Pritchard <laughs> did that recently and he was really surprised um, that he only managed 50 miles. Well, you know, it'll be one of them, won't it? <laughs> no, well, I, I, <laughs> it, it'll probably test how good a runner I am and, and not trying to wing it on the mountains, you know, yeah. because I think, uh, I think it's like a few people have tried to get me to do some of the flatter, some of the flatter races, and I'm thinking, well, I'm more. In, you are more, that's more running entities. It, it's would more. Be, let's just clarify that would be 200 miles though in 48 hours, wouldn't that'd it? That'd be 200 miles. In, uh, I, <laughs> I probably, you know, I'm I'm just gonna go until uh, I, ca I can't do it anymore. Mm. But I think because it's. I think because it's it's my thing that I'm doing, I'll probably just carry on. I may not keep up the four, you know, and do the 200 miles in 48 hours, but I'll see if I can keep running for 48 hours. Yeah. I've already done that. I've already been on my feet for 40, for 47 hours. Uh, obviously doing that, it, but it's like, it'll be different doing the, the, four, the four mile loop and keep doing that. Because I'm doing, it'll be trial again. Because uh, I'll be doing it over the chase. I think there's 200 metres in elevation. I think the course the, is 4.2, which I'm not bothered about the extra two anyway. It doesn't really yeah. matter. I'm sure you'll make a massive dent in it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, so we're, Rich, we're, we, I, I've, I've got to cut it there because <laughs> it, like, if it go, if we go too long, mate, people are going to drop off and I, and I really, and I don't want yeah. them looking, I don't want them looking at the podcast going, oh, I haven't got three hours to watch this. Because your story, everybody needs to listen to this. <laughs> um, thanks ever so much for coming on the show. I really hope we get a chance to run together at some point. Yeah, um, yeah. At least you're I'm unmistakable. Um, uh, with the beard, I'll be like, there he is. <laughs> yeah, shall I tell you what I did? I did a 24-hour a race and I did 77 miles in that. But everybody thought I was winning. But there was somebody who who caned me. But because I was so identifiable, they just saw me going around and thought, oh, he must be winning. Look, look, you know, like 15 hours later, he's still running around. He must be winning. I wasn't. I was. I, I think I was about eight. But because I was so, mis you know, <laughs> everybody knew it was me. So, yeah, we, we'll have to at some point, I'm sure. Definitely. Listen. I'm, I'm sure mental people end up going doing the same races anyway i think so yeah <laughs> <At> some point <laughs> stay on the stay on the line mate so i can thank you properly but massive thank you again um for the purposes of the tape and to everybody at home i hope you've enjoyed this as much as i have it's been uh uh it's been inspirational it's been a bit emotional as well and i hope that I, well, I know that many of you will take a, an enormous amount from this and uh, we'll put all Rich's links below. If you're going to follow him, give him your support. If you could like and subscribe to the podcast, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>